Classical Latin is the modern term used to describe the form of the Latin language recognized as standard by writers of the late Roman Republican, the Roman Empire. In some later periods it was regarded as good Latin, with later versions being viewed as debased or corrupt. The word Latin is now taken by default as meaning classical Latin, so that, for example, modern Latin textbooks describe classical Latin. Marcus Tullius Cicero and his contemporaries of the late Republic, while using lingua latina and serma latinus to mean the Latin language as opposed to the Greek or other languages, and serma vulgaris or serma vulgi to refer to the vernacular of the uneducated and less educated masses regarded the speech they valued most and in which they wrote as Latin eaters, Latin a tea, with the implication of good. Sometimes it is called serma familiaris, speech of the good families, serma urbanis, speech of the city, or rarely serma nobilis, noble speech. But mainly besides Latin eaters it was Latin, in good Latin, or Latinus, good Latin, Latin eaters was spoken as well as written. Moreover, it was the language taught by the schools. Prescriptive rules therefore applied to it, and where a special subject was concerned, such as poetry or rhetoric, additional rules applied as well. Now that the spoken Latin eaters has become extinct the rules of the, for the most part, Polished texts may give the appearance of an artificial language but Latin eaters was a form of serma, or spoken language and as such retains a spontaneity. No authors are noted for the type of rigidity evidenced by stylized art, except possibly the repetitious abbreviations and stock phrases of inscriptions, philological constructs. The classical good Latin in philology is classical Latin literature. The term refers to the canonicity of works of literature written in Latin in the late Roman Republic and the early to middle Roman Empire. That is to say, that of belonging to an exclusive group of authors that were considered to be emblematic of a certain genre. The term classicus was devised by the Romans themselves to translate Greek gamma kappa rho iota theta epsilon nu tau epsilon sigma. Select referring to authors who wrote in Greek that were considered model. Before then, classus, in addition to being a naval fleet, was a social class in one of the diachronic divisions of Roman society according to property ownership by the Roman constitution. The word is a transliteration of Greek kappa lambda sigma iota sigma calling, used to rank army draftees by property from first to fifth class. Classicus is anything primary classus, first class, such as the authors of the polished works of Latin eaters, or Therma Urbanus. It had nuances of the certified and the authentic. Testus classicus, reliable witness, it was in this sense that Marcus Cornelius Frunter in the 2nd century AD used scriptors classici, first class or reliable authors, whose works could be relied upon as model of good Latin. This is the first known reference, possibly innovated at this time, to classical applied to authors by virtue of the authentic language of their works. The canonical in imitation of the Greek grammarians, the Roman ones, such as Quintilian, drew up lists termed indices or ordens on the model of the Greek lists, termed pinakes, considered classical. The receptor scriptors, select writers, all Aeschylus includes many authors, such as Plautus, who are currently considered writers of Old Latin and not strictly in the period of Classical Latin. The Classical Romans distinguish Old Latin as Prisca Latin eaters and not Serma Vulgaris. Each author in the Roman lists was considered equivalent to one in the Greek, for example Aeneas was the Latin Homer, the Aeneid was a new Iliad, and so on. The lists of classical authors were as far as the Roman grammarians went in developing a philology. The topic remained at that point while interest in the classici scriptors declined in the medieval period as the best Latin yielded to medieval Latin, somewhat less than the best by classical standards. The Renaissance brought a revival of interest in restoring as much of Roman culture as could be restored and with it the return of the concept of classic. 
the best Thomas Sabre in 1548 referred to Les bons et classiques poetess François, meaning John de Mun and Alain Chartier, which was the first modern application of the word. According to Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, the term classical from classicus entered modern English in 1599, some 50 years after its reintroduction on the continent. Governor William Bradford in 1648 referred to synods of a separatist church's classical meetings in his dialogue, a report of a meeting between New England-born young men and ancient men from Holland and England. In 1715 Lawrence Etchard's Classical Geographical Dictionary was published. In 1736 Robert Ainsworth's Thesaurus Lingua Latini Compendarius turned English words and expressions into proper and classical Latin. In 1768, David Ruinkin recast the mold of the view of the classical by applying the word canon to the pinnacles of orators. After the biblical canon or list of authentic books of the Bible, Ruiwinkin had a kind of secular catechism in mind. The Ages of Latin In 1870 Wilhelm Sigismund II fell in Geschichte der Romischen Literatur innovated the definitive philological classification of classical Latin based on the metaphoric uses of the ancient myth of the Ages of Man, a practice then universally current. A golden age and a silver age of classical Latin were to be presumed. The practice and two falls classification, with modifications, are still in use. His work was translated into English as soon as published in German by Wilhelm Wagner, who corresponded with Tufel. Wagner published the English translation in 1873. Tufel divides the chronology of classical Latin authors into several periods according to political events, rather than by style. Regarding the style of the literary Latin of those periods he had but few comments. Tufel was to go on with other editions of his history, but meanwhile it had come out in English almost as soon as it did in German and found immediate favorable reception. In 1877 Charles Thomas Crutwell produced the first English work along the same lines. In his preface he refers to Tufel's admirable history, without which many chapters in the present work could not have attained completeness, and also gives credit to Wagner. Crutwell adopts the same periods with minor differences, however, where Tufel's work is mainly historical. Crutwell's work contains detailed analyses of style. Nevertheless, like Tufel he encounters the same problem of trying to summarize the voluminous detail in a way that captures in brief the gist of a few phases of writing styles. Like Tufel, he has trouble finding a name for the first of the three periods, calling it mainly, from Livius to Sula, the language, he says, is marked by immaturity of art and language, by a vigorous but ill-disciplined imitation of Greek poetical models, and in prose by a dry sententiousness of style, gradually giving way to a clear and fluent strength. These abstracts have little meaning to those not well versed in Latin literature. In fact, Crutwell admits, the ancients, indeed, saw a difference between Aeneas, Pacuvius, and Axius. But it may be questioned whether the advance would be perceptible by us. Some of Crutwell's ideas have become established in Latin philology. While praising the application of rules to classical Latin, most intensely in the Golden Age, he says, in gaining accuracy, however, classical Latin suffered a grievous loss. It became cultivated as distinct from a natural language, spontaneity, therefore, became impossible and soon invention also ceased, in a certain sense, therefore, Latin was studied as a dead language, while it was still a living. A second problem is the appropriateness of Tufel's scheme to the concept of classical Latin, which Tufel does not discuss. Crutwell addresses the problem, however, altering the concept of the classical, as the best Latin is defined as Golden Latin, the second of the three periods, the other two periods considered classical are left hanging.
while on the one hand assigning to Old Latin the term pre-classical and by implication the term post-classical to Silver Latin Crutwell realizes that this construct is not according to ancient usage and asserts dot the epithet classical is by many restricted to the authors who wrote in it. Golden Latin. It is best, however, not to narrow unnecessarily the sphere of classicity, to exclude Terence on the one hand or Tacitus and Pliny on the other, would savor of artificial restriction rather than that of a natural classification. The contradiction remains, Terence is and is not a classical author depending on context. Authors of the Golden Age. After defining a first period of inscriptional Latin and the literature of the earliest known authors and fragments, to which he assigns no definitive name of Tufel presents the second period, his major Das Goldenes Ital to der Romischen Literature, the Golden Age of Roman Literature, dated 671-767 AUC or 83 BC to 14 AD according to his time reckoning. Between the dictatorship of Lucius Cornelius Sulla Felix and the death of the Emperor Augustus, Ivit Wagner translating Tufel writes the golden age of the Roman literature as that period in which the climax was reached in the perfection of form, and in most respects also in the methodical treatment of the subject matters. It may be subdivided between the generations, in the first of which prose culminated, while poetry was principally developed in the Augustan age. The Ciceronian Age was dated 671-711 AUC, ending just after the assassination of Gaius Julius Caesar, and the Augustan 711-67 AUC, ending with the death of Augustus. The Ciceronian Age is further divided by the consulship of Cicero in 691 AUC or 63 BC into a first and second half. Authors are assigned to these periods by years of principal achievements. The Golden Age had already made an appearance in German philology but in a less systematic way. In Bielfeld's 1770 Elements of Universal Erudition the author says, the Second Age of Latin began about the time of Caesar, his ages are different from Tufel's, and ended with Tiberius. This is what is called the Augustan Age, which was perhaps of all others the most brilliant, a period at which it should seem as if the greatest men, and the immortal authors, had met together upon the earth in order to write the Latin language in its utmost purity and perfection, and of Tacitus, dot his conceits and sententious style is not that of the Golden Age. Tufel evidently received the ideas of a golden and silver Latin from an existing tradition and embedded them in a new system, transforming them as he thought best. In Crutwell's introduction, the Golden Age is dated 80 BC to 14 AD, which is about the same as Tufel's. Of this second period, Crutwell says that it represents the highest excellence in prose and poetry, paraphrasing Tufel. The Ciceronian Age is now the Republican period and is dated 8042 BC through the Battle of Philippi. Later in the book Crutwell omits Tufel's first half of the Ciceronian and starts the Golden Age at Cicero's consulship of 63 BC, an era perpetuated into Crutwell's second edition as well. He must mean 80 BC as he includes Varro in Golden Latin. Tufel's Augustan Age is Crutwell's Augustan Epoch, 42 BC to 14 AD. Republican the literary histories list all authors canonical to the Ciceronian Age even though their works may be fragmentary or may not have survived at all, with the exception of a few major writers, such as Cicero, Caesar, Virgil and Catullus. Ancient accounts of Republican literature are glowing accounts of jurists and orators who wrote prolifically but who now can't be read because their works have been lost, or analyses of language and style that appear insightful but can't be verified because there are no surviving instances. In that sense the pages of literary history are peopled with shadows. Aquilius Gallus, Quintus Hortensius Hortulus. Lucius Licinius Lucullus and many others who left a reputation but no readable works, they are to be presumed in the Golden Age by their associations. 
a list of some canonical authors of the period, whose works have survived in whole or in part is as follows. Marcus Terentius Varro, highly influential grammarian. Titus Pomponius Atticus, publisher and correspondent of Cicero. Marcus Tullius Cicero, orator, philosopher, correspondent whose works define golden Latin prose and are used in Latin curricula beyond the elementary level. Servius Sulpicius Rufus, jurist, poet. Decimus Labirius, writer of mimes. Marcus Furius Bibiculus, writer of Ludicra. Gaius Julius Caesar, general, statesman, historian. Gaius Oppius, secretary to Julius Caesar, probable author under Caesar's name. Gaius Matius, public figure, correspondent with Cicero. Cornelius Nepus, biographer. Publius Cyrus, writer of mimes and maxims. Quintus Cornificius, public figure and writer on rhetoric. Titus Lucretius Carus, poet, philosopher. Publius Nigidius Figulus, public officer, grammarian. Aulus Hirtius, public officer, military historian. Gaius Helvius Sinner, poet. Marcus Celius Rufus, orator, correspondent with Cicero. Gaius Seleucius Crispus, historian. Marcus Porcius Cato Utisensis, orator. Publius Valerius Cato, poet, grammarian. Gaius Valerius Catullus, poet. Gaius Licinius Mesa Calvus, orator, poet. Augustin the Golden Age is divided by the assassination of Julius Caesar. In the wars that followed, the Republican generation of literary men was lost. As most of them had taken the losing side, Marcus Tullius Cicero was beheaded in the street as he inquired from his litter what the disturbance was. They were replaced by a new generation that had grown up and been educated under the old and were now to make their mark under the watchful eye of the new emperor. As the demand for great orators was more or less over, the talent shifted emphasis to poetry. Other than the historian Livy, the most remarkable writers of the period were the poets Virgil, Horace, and Ovid. Although Augustus evidenced some toleration to Republican sympathizers, he exiled Ovid, and imperial tolerance ended with the continuance of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Augustan writers include Publius Virgilius Maro, Quintus Horatius Flaccus, known for lyric poetry and satires, Sextus Aurelius Propertius, poet, Albius Tibullus, elegiac poet, Titus Livius, historian, Publius Ovidius Naso, poet, Gratius Faliscus, poet, Marcus Manilius, astrologer, poet, Gaius Julius Hyginus, librarian, poet, mythographer, Marcus Varius Flaccus, grammarian, philologist, calendarist, Marcus Vitruvius Pollio, engineer, architect, Marcus Antistius Labio, jurist, philologist, Lucius Cestius Pius, Latin educator, Nius Pompeius Trogus, historian, naturalist, Marcus Porcius Latro, rhetorician, Gaius Falgius Rufus, poet, 